All right, hello again, brethren, and welcome back to part three of this video teaching, as this is the third segment to this video, and possibly could be the final segment, depending on how much time is remaining on my video recorder here. I actually tried checking how much time was left on the recorder earlier, but for some reason I could not view the remaining time on it, and so sometime after 35, possibly 45 minutes of recording, this, uh, this recording could shut off suddenly after that time is expired. So if that does happen to where um, the recorder does shut off as I'm in the process of doing, completing this teaching, I'll just go ahead and plan on uploading or recording an, a fourth segment to this teaching and then uploading it as well. But we'll see how it goes and um, hopefully I do have enough time though to finish off this teaching today or at least this segment of the teaching, this uh, third segment. Having said that though, um, basically for those who have already watched the first two segments of this video on the subject of dispensationalism and the three major judgments, I've already talked about mainly what you know dispensationalism is and why I believe that every child of God out there should study this subject of dispensationalism, why I believe it's important to understand and on the framework of you know understanding the, the, the Word of God in general. I also discussed some of the pitfalls that I believe that any child of God can fall into as he begins to study this issue of dispensational theology. And of course, and it's not just with this, this uh, doctrinal subject of dispensational truth, it, it can be with any subject, you know. Um, we as, you know, we who are born again, you know, we have, who have been, um, you know, translated into the kingdom of light, we who are born again, we're children of God, children of light. We are not, um, we are not exempt or uh, we are, just because we've been saved and we, you know, we, we have a new nature now, that does not mean that we, we will not uh, be tempted, uh, you know, does not mean we'll not be tempted to fall into pride, okay? It does not mean we'll not be tempted with pride, the pride of life, you know, the, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. You know, the enemy is going to attack us even harder, okay? And I do believe that. Any, the, any child of God, any Christian, is, if he's not careful, if he doesn't take heed, lest he fall, any Christian is, is prone to falling into the pitfall of pride and being puffed up. Because as I said in my other, um, within, as I said in my first two segments uh, of this teaching, any Christian can, um, when he studies a new subject or he studies and learns new truths from the Word of God, if he's not careful, he can get puffed up because knowledge does puff up. And so, but as the Word of God also says, charity edifies. And so, I do believe, brethren, that as you're studying these, uh, this doctrine of dispensational truths in the Word of God, I believe it's very important, no matter what subject you're studying, whether it's dispensationalism, or any other subject, I believe it's important to maintain a, a spirit of meekness, humility, and, and charity. That way you um, continue to, uh, that way you can continue to, you know, live, you know, peacefully with other brethren as much as possible. And so, now having already addressed that, I'm going to say this as well, brethren. In this particular segment of this video, now we've already talked about what dispensationalism is and what it what it deals with, you know how it deals with God's God's dealings with mankind from one economy, one dispensation to another. Now what we're going to be focusing on are the three main judgments. Okay, now, I did mention them briefly. I did mention the three main judgments briefly in the first segment of this teaching, but I didn't really I didn't really have the time to get into it as I wanted to. So that that is going to be my focus. And my purpose in this segment is just to focus mainly on talking, telling you about and teaching you about these three main judgments, okay, that are mentioned in Scripture. Um, there are three major judgments, as I refer to them. Uh, that, be, that would be the judgment seat of Christ, uh, the judgment of the nations, and the great white throne judgment. And in, the, in addition to, to um, basically uh, uh, talking about these three major judgments in this teaching today, I'm also going to be talking about, you know, how, I'm going to show you how they're different. I'm going to show you the purpose of each one of these particular judgments. Okay. And I'm going to show you why it's important 
that we understand the difference between these three major judgments. Okay, because when you understand the dispensational distinctions between these different these very these three major judgments, your understanding of Bible prophecy and eschatology will be better. I, I'm definitely uh, convinced of that. And so we're going to go ahead and start our teaching today now, brethren. And um, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles. We're going to basically go in order. We're going, to, we're going to start out looking at the scriptures that specifically deal with the judgment seat of Christ, okay? Which is the judgment for born again believers. And I'm going to show you why that's so. It's not for anybody else except for Christians. So please turn, again turn with me to Romans chapter 14. This will be the very first scripture, passage of scripture that deals mainly and specifically with this judgment. So Romans, it's Romans chapter 14. And we're going to read from verse 6 here. We're going to read from verse 6. And we're going to go down to, actually no, we're going to uh, start out at verse 4, okay? We're going to read from verse 4 and we're going to go down to verse uh, 12. So we're going to read about 8 verses in this passage of scripture. Romans chapter 14, so, and we're going to be in here at verse 4. All right, here it says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. You know, it's talking about basically one man may prefer to worship on Saturday, another man may prefer to worship on Sunday. Okay, some some Christians they, you know, they see every day as a, as, a, as a light. You know, whether they worship on a Tuesday or go to assembly on a Thursday, it's you know, it's really it doesn't matter what day it falls on. Okay, so, you know, some Christians have to worship on different days, especially those that live in, you know, communistic countries that where they live under a tyrannical tyrannical government. That if they find Christians, they'll persecute them, they'll throw them in jail, or possibly even ex execute them. You know, Christians that live in these type of tyrannical, tyrannical countries, yeah, a, a Christian, any Christian that lives in a ty tyrannical country, uh, most likely will will um, basically have to worship on different days of the week, Thursday, Wednesday, and so forth. And so that's why I believe that Paul. The Holy Ghost uh, allowed this liberty as a Christian for uh, us as believers to, you know, either you know choose to worship on one day or worship on different days out of the week. But continuing here, uh, let's see here. Let me read verse five again. One man esteemeth one day above another; another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in, in his own mind. Okay. Verse 6, he that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that esteemeth, he that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore, or, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. You know, here's the key verse here, brethren. This is the verse that talks about the judgment seat of Christ. Now notice what, notice what Paul says here. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set up not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? Now, in this passage, Paul is writing to Christians, obviously. He's not writing to lost people. Paul is writing to the Christians who who are at Rome here, okay? And he says this, for we, you know, he basically is asking these uh these Christians here, why are you judging your other brother? When it comes to when it comes to uh issues of liberty, okay, you know, worshiping on a such and such a day, or eating certain meats, or not eating certain meats, he's basically you know writing to these believers, you know, why are you judging your other other brother in these matters? You know, these are matters of Christian liberty. And so, and notice he says here, for we, you know, we, talking about, you know, Christians, and Paul is including himself in this matter, because he's a, you know, he's part of the body of Christ. He says, for we, not lost people, but we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
and then continuing here in verse 11, for it is written, as I live, say the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So um, we see here that, um, you know, Paul is, is basically exhorting his brethren here to, to have this knowledge that there is a judgment that we will stand before as well. Just because we're saved and we've been born again and our sins have been judged, um, you know, and we're, we're, we're secure in Jesus Christ. He's basically exhorting these fellow believers that there's still a judgment that we must prepare for. Okay. And that specifically is, and he's talking about the judgment seat of Christ, where Jesus Christ will judge our works. Okay. That's why, again, that's why Paul says, for we must appear. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. When he says we, he is, again, he's referring to believers. He's writing to Christians here at Rome. He's not talking to lost people here. He's dealing with the Christians here at Rome. And he was not only was he dealing with their uh, judging of, of other believers in matters of liberty, you know, whether or not, you know, this Christian can eat certain meats and, or whether or not he can, or whether or not, you know, you know, we should uh, honor this day above another or we should honor every day alike. Okay, these are all issues of, you know, liberty you know, uh, that we have as Christians in the Lord. And so Paul is dealing with this issue of judging others, judging other believers in regards to uh, issues of liberty, Christian liberty. And he's also exhorting these brethren to understand and know that they will want, we want, one day we will all stand before this judgment seat of Christ and that we will give an account to God for our life, for our service to him. And so... Um, um, and I'll, and I'll also say this, we know that this is talking about, and this is dealing with issues of liberty because in the very next verse, verse 13, it says here, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. Okay. He's not saying that we can't judge righteous judgment. That's not what Paul is saying here. He's just saying this in regards to this issue of these different liberties that we have, let us not judge one another in these, you know, when it comes to our freedom and our Christian liberty in Christ. Okay. But judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Okay. Um, I know, and I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus, and this is Paul speaking again, that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean to him it is unclean. So again, uh, but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now, but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be, spoke, be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is, is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So again, in the context of this passage here, Paul is talking about, you know, uh, issues of, you know, Christian liberty, okay? There are, there are many Christians out there that are okay with eating pork. Some Christians are not. They're weak in that area. They, they consider pork to be unclean, so they, don't, they won't touch pork, you know, and that's fine. You know, Paul is saying, don't judge your brother if he, doesn't, if he chooses not to eat pork in regards to this matter, or in regards to worshiping on a Saturday or on a Sunday, okay? Don't judge your brother in these particular matters, because um, this will all be sorted out at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, for having looked at this scripture, brethren, we're going to look at our next scripture, which will be 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And um, in 1 Corinthians 3, the judgment seat of Christ is not specifically mentioned, but it's described to a, it's more, it's given, uh, the, the details in the, about the judgment seat of Christ are more specific, I would say that, in this passage of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, we're going to go ahead and read from verse, uh, we're going to go ahead and begin at verse 4 again, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to go ahead and read up to verse I would say uh, verse 17. So we're going to read quite a few verses here in this uh, chapter of 1 Corinthians 3. So let's go ahead and begin reading. Here it says, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. 
It is God that gets the increase. He's the one that gives the increase, okay? Continuing here, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now get that, that this is talking about labor, working. Okay, verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ, which is Jesus Christ. That's very true. You know, our foundation, brethren, is Jesus Christ. That's what we need to build upon. We don't need to be building on any other foundation, but we need to be building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Now, notice the next verse here. Now, if any man build upon build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hair, stubble. Every, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Okay, so here Paul is talking about, again, he's talking about the judgment of Christ. He's not, so he didn't specifically name it in this passage, but he's talking about it because he's talking about a, a judgment a, uh, of works here. Okay, that's why if you read back in verse, uh, verse 8 here, it says, you know, uh, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. He's, you know, he's talking about every man will receive the, la the, re the reward of his labors. And, we, and he says, we clearly here, for we are labors together with God. Okay? And you notice here, it says this, if any man build upon this foundation, the foundation of Jesus Christ, if we build upon it gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hair, stubble, it says every work, every man's works will be made manifest. But notice here also that not only will our works be made manifest, not only will our works be judged at the judgment seat of Christ, but the motive, the very motive behind our works will be judged as well. And that's the thing you got you to understand too, brethren. You know, it's important to serve the Lord, but it's important to also judge and to discern what our motives are for serving the Lord. You know, because... And that's another reason why I made made that statement in the first segment of this teaching, and that is this. As important as it is to serve the Lord, it's also important to walk with the Lord at the same time. Because as we're serving the Lord, we need to keep a close fellowship with the Lord. We need to be walking holy. We need to be walking sanctified. The closer we walk with the Lord, it's going to be better. Because if we are walking with the Lord closely and examining ourselves daily in the light of His Word, His Holy Word we will most likely be, um, we will serve the Lord, we will work for the Lord out of a pure heart and a right motive. And so, again, let's read this again. It says, every man's work shall be made manifest. Okay, our works will be judged at the judgment of Christ. Okay, uh, because for the day shall declare it, because it shall, be, it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Again, our motives behind these very works will be judged as well. Why did you go out there street preaching? Were you, were you just going out there to preach on the streets to, you know, rail on sinners, just basically to show off, to be seen among, to be seen of, seen of men? Was that your motive? That's something that we gotta ask ourselves, brethren. Especially those of us who street preach, who preach on the streets. Why are you going out there? Are you going out there? Are you really going out there to serve the Lord? To because you have a burden for the lost, you want to see souls saved for the Lord's glory. You know, you, is that your your real motive? Is that your goal? It should be. Or is your goal, is your motive, just to go out there to rail on sinners and to just be seen of men? See, our motives, brethren, will be judged at the judgment of Christ. Not just our works, but our motives. And also understand this. Notice this as well. If any man's work, this is verse 14, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So notice this also. What this passage is teaching is that uh, no Christian is going to lose his salvation. Okay? No, no Christian is able to lose his salvation. Once we're saved, we are eternally secure. We are saved forever. That's what you got to understand. Uh, at the judgment of Christ, the motive, the the the, the, uh, 
the purpose of the judgment seat of Christ is to judge every Christian's works to determine what rewards, what, what millennial inheritance they will be receiving, what crowns they'll be getting from the Lord. Okay, the judgment seat of Christ is not to determine whether or not we are going to enter into heaven, okay? Let me say that again, because again, there's a lot of Christians out there that believe that they can lose their salvation, you know, if they don't continue to do good works or if they, if they commit a certain sin. They believe they can lose their salvation. Let me repeat this, brethren. The judgment seat of Christ is not to determine whether or not we will make it into heaven when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not what the judgment seat of Christ is for. Okay, we where we spend eternity that was determined at Calvary. Okay, what we did with Jesus Christ when we came to Him broken as a sinner, and when we when we looked to Calvary, okay, figuratively figuratively speaking, when we looked to Calvary, when we looked to Jesus Christ and placed our faith in His blood that He shed for us on Calvary, our eternal destination was determined. It was fixed. Okay. Okay. So understand that where we spend eternity, whether or not we go to heaven or hell, that's determined at Calvary. That's not determined at the judgment seat of Christ. When you when you believe when you place your faith on Jesus Christ and His blood atonement that was shed for you at Calvary, your sins were washed away, and your your destination was determined and it was fixed. Okay, you were translated from darkness into light. You were delivered from the power of Satan, and you were uh, translated over to the power. And the kingdom of God, and you will have once you were born again. Once God saved you, your destination was uh, pre. You were actually it was predestinated. You were predestinated to be to go to heaven, and you were predestinated to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, God's son, God's son. So this judgment here of you know the judgment of Christ is it's simply to determine our level of rewards. Our level of inheritance in the millennial kingdom, and also the number of crowns, the type of crowns we will be receiving, because there are I, there are five, from what I understand from the scriptures, there are five different crowns. Um, there are five different crowns that we can that we have the opportunity to earn and receive at the judgment seat of Christ. I can't, I can't say that every Christian will receive all the crowns, you know, because God is no respect of persons. You know, not every Christian is going to get all the all the rewards that they could have they had that they had the potential of getting. You just got to understand that there there will be loss of rewards. The Christians will suffer loss. There will be a lot of Christians, including myself, no doubt. I, I believe as much as I've messed up after I've gotten saved, I believe that there are rewards that I will suffer. I will lose, and, I, and I'm ashamed to mention that, but it's nevertheless it's most likely true. I do believe I'm I'm fearful of that. And there are a lot of rewards I'm going to, you know, suffer loss of. But not loss of salvation, okay? Understand that. And so I wanted to reemphasize re that point. When we stand as, as born-again believers, as born-again Christians, when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, our works are judged to determine our level of rewards, our level of millennial inheritance in the millennial kingdom of Christ, and to determine how many crowns and the, the kind of crowns that we will receive to lay at our Lord Jesus Christ's feet. That's the purpose. That's the that is the purpose of the judgment seat of Christ. And it is only for born again Christians. It's not for lost people. No lost person will appear at the judgment seat of Christ. Also, no Old Testament saint will appear at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? Now, the you know, like David, Noah, Moses, Adam. Now they have their judgment, and we will get into that too. We will get into that judgment very soon here. But, but they will not be standing at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, they, they will not be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. I should say that. You know, the Old Testament saints, the the saints in the tribulation, they'll have their judgment. Okay, they're they're saved. They'll be saved. Okay, but they're not part of the body of Christ, and that's that's important to understand. So let's. Um, Actually, let me continue. Let me re finish reading this passage here. Uh, let me, verse 16 and 17 here. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. See? Um, as Christians, the temple of God abides in us. Our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, and our body is holy. And so if we destroy this temple, God has a right. God can 
God will destroy us. Physically speaking, he'll, he'll destroy us, destroy our body, he'll destroy this flesh, and he'll take us home early. Wounds of salvation. But there, the, the Bible does talk about there is a sin unto death, and there are, I'm, I'm convinced that there are Christians that have committed that sin unto death, but that does not mean that they lost their salvation. You know, once you're born again, you're born again. You cannot be unborn again. But now we're going to, having addressed that, brother, we're going to go to um, the next passage that deals with the judgment of Christ, and that's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this is the one that a lot of, a lot of the street preachers will quote to lost people. Okay? And um, again, in, uh, like I said, I understand, you know, nobody's going to have perfect doctrine following this earth. I understand that no Christian out there understands perfect doctrine. You know, I understand that. But this video, again, is just to offer a correction, a gentle correction to those out there, um, street, preacher, street preaching, brethren or not, you know, any Christian out there, like, like I said, whether you preach on the streets or not, this is to just offer you some help, some exhortation to understand uh, better the, 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 uh, this issue of, of the right div division of, of God's word. So we're going to turn to 2 Corinthians 5 here, and we're going to read... Uh, beginning at verse, let's see here, we're going to read, I want to start out at verse, uh, let's see here, verse 5, we're going to read from verse 5, and we're going to go down to verse uh, 12, okay? So let's go ahead and read, uh, beginning here at verse 5. Okay, here it says, in verse 5, beginning here. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who, hath, who also hath given unto us the earnest of his spirit, of the spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We are confident, oh, verse 7, for we walk by faith, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether we whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. Again, here Paul's talking about our laboring. We're laboring together in the Lord for the Lord. Again, and here it says, verse ten: For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Again, that now here it's mentioned again in this passage. It's mentioned specifically. It's talking about this judgment seat of Christ. Okay, for we must all appear before. Again, Paul's talking about. He's saying we. He's referring to himself as well. Paul. The, the very same judgment that you and I stand at, Christian, Paul will be there. You know, Paul, just as you and I are in the body of Christ, Paul the Apostle, he'll be in, he's in the body of Christ as well. All the Apostles were in the body of Christ. So, Peter, John, Paul the Apostle, they will be standing at this judgment seat of Christ as well, as well as we. they got to give an account to God, to God as well. So it says here, for we, he's not talking to lost people, but he's saying we, for we must all appear, born again Christians, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one of may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. And so, that's basically the, um, I believe that's probably the last scripture that specifically mentions this judgment and that, you know, talks about it. And, and you know, I mean, Paul doesn't really go too much into this judgment, but from what, the, the, from what he does write about it, you know, from what the Holy Ghost, you know, moved him to write concerning this judgment we do understand that it is a judgment of our works okay but it's not only a judgment of our works it's not only a judgment of our labor but it's a judgment for our motive for doing what we're doing okay so that's why paul says in first Corinthians 3 every man's work shall be made manifest the fire shall try every man's work out and not only his work but of what sort it is so your work will be judged at the judgment of christ and your the motive your heart's motive for why you're doing that work. Again, when you go, again, brother, I'm going to ask you this question. For those of you that preach on the streets like I do, 
Why do you go out in there? Why do you go out there and preach on the streets? Do you go out there because you have a burden for lost souls to see people get saved by the power of the gospel? Do you want souls earnestly to get saved for God's glory, for the glory of the Lamb Jesus Christ, or are you just going out there to, you know, be seen of men? Are you going out there to rail on sinners or to show off? What's your motive? What's your purpose for serving the Lord? Are you walking with the Lord? See, that's why it's so important to understand this judgment, this judgment of Christ. And it's not a, and again, it's not a judgment to determine whether or not we go to heaven or not. Whether or not we go to heaven, that was determined at Calvary. That was determined at what, um, when Christ gave himself as a ransom on Calvary, on the cross of Calvary. That was, you know, and once we placed our faith in the atonement that was made at Calvary through Jesus, by Jesus Christ, where we spent eternity, that was determined there. Okay? Our sins were, were washed away clean at Calvary by the blood of Jesus Christ. What happens at the judgment seat of Christ is simply is, is to determine our level of rewards, our level of millennial inheritance in the kingdom of Christ, and our level of our um, the type of crowns we'll be receiving. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is for. That's its purpose. It's not for unbelievers. It's not for lost people. It's for born again Christians. Having said that, though, that was the, that's the first major judgment. Now we're going to be looking at the second major judgment here. And um, let me see how much time I have here. Okay, I think I still have, I have a little bit more time, so I'm going to go ahead and continue here. We're going to go, the first scripture here we're going to go to is uh, Joel, Joel, the book of Joel, chapter 3. We're going to be in your Old Testament now. And we're going to go to the book of Joel, chapter 3. And uh, we're going to begin at verse, I believe we're going to begin at verse 11. But let, me, let me make sure I'm correct when I say that. Joel chapter 3, and again we're going to um, begin at verse 11. We're going to read down to verse 17 here. Okay? And here it says, Assemble, assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather thither, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Now notice here, um, this judgment, particular judgment here, is good. Notice that the Lord is um, addressing the heathen here, okay? Uh, which would be another, uh, this would be another term for nations, you know, the Gentile nations. He's not addressing Christians here, okay? This is um, another scriptural proof that the judgment seat of Christ is very different from the ju this judgment of the nations, okay? God is dealing with heathen here. He's not dealing with born again people. He's dealing with heathen, nations, Gentiles. Okay? Continuing here now in verse 13. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the, the fats overflow, the fats overflow, for, the, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the, heat and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people, referring to Israel. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Verse 17, So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. Now, um, again, brethren, this is the judgment. This judgment here is about the judgment of the nations. This is where God will plead; He will judge with the nations for how they dealt with His people Israel. Okay, and I believe, you know, of course, I believe more specifically 
how they dealt with his people Israel in the time of Jacob's trouble, in the tribulation, seven-year tribulation, which will take place after the rapture of the body of Christ, okay? But notice here also the location of this judgment. It says here that uh, the, the nations, the heathen, will be gathered at a valley called Jehoshaphat, okay? Or it's, it's, called, um, it's called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. I, I stand corrected. Yeah, it's the valley. It's, it's referred to as the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Okay. Notice this judgment is going to take place here on earth. Okay. Not in heaven. This judgment of the nations takes place on earth. Uh, basically here, it looks like it's here in Jerusalem. The judgment of the seat of Christ, wherefore it took place, it's going to take place in heaven. Now, there could be some speculation that the judgment seat of Christ actually takes place in the clouds, which... I mean, I can understand that argument because the rapture talks about us meeting the Lord in the air, in the clouds. But I, I do believe, according to the testimony of John in Revelation chapter 4, where John is, um, he sees the, the throne of God and the rainbow that's surrounding the throne of God. I, I believe more specifically the judgment seat of Christ will happen in the third heaven. I don't believe it's going to be in the second heavens where you can see the stars and the, you know, the clouds. I believe it's going to happen in the... Uh, I believe it's going to be in the, the third heaven where God actually dwells in his, um, in his uh, heavenly throne. Okay. But again, this judgment though, the judgment of, of the heathen, the, ju the judgment of the nations is going to take place here on earth at the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Okay. And again, it's going to be in Jerusalem, which is why it says here in verse, uh, verse 12, verse 16, the Lord shall also roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. So this judgment where God is dealing with these different various nations, Gentile nations, it will take place, you know, in this valley and it will be out here on earth. So this is a, and this is, as we'll see, as we turn to our next scripture here, which is going to be Matthew, uh, Matthew 25, we'll see that the purpose of this uh, judgment is mainly, um, again, to, 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 deal with the Gentile nations for how they treated God's people, Israel, the Jews, and also to determine who gets permitted into the millennial kingdom of Christ. And so we're going to turn to our next scripture here. That was, uh, uh, yeah, that was the, the scripture, the first scripture uh, dealing with this judgment was Joel chapter 3, just in case you all want to look that up later on in your own time. Joel chapter 3 in your Old Testament. And this next scripture is Matthew 25 and this will be um, this will probably get into a little more detail concerning the, uh, what this judgment will um, entail and uh, what will take place and how how um, God will determine who gets into the millennial kingdom and who doesn't okay so and actually before um, before I, I, I get into this uh, restart reading the scripture I think I need to uh, close out this video and do another segment because I see here I'm running down on time brethren and so yeah I think I'm gonna go ahead and uh, end this video part this part here and I'll just have to start uh, uh, a fourth segment so we'll go ahead and uh, close out this uh, segment and we'll see you in the next video brethren thank you thank you for watching